And with this process, there is a considerable release of energy, and we have demonstrated that this could be sustained on its own. Uh, in other words, much more energy is coming out than we're putting in. In 1989, two researchers called Pons and Fleischmann held a press conference announcing to the world that they'd created cold fusion in a test tube. It was one of those too-good-to-be-true moments that was, yeah, too-good-to-be-true. I often used to go to press conferences like this where a new discovery was announced, and while most reporters duly scribbled it down and asked excited questions, the first thing the science journalists wanted to know was, where has this been published? Now, why is that important? In this video, we're going to find out. And along the way, you'll learn how to publish your very own scientific paper, even if you've never touched a test tube since elementary school. You'll find out how to tell the difference between real scientific journals and phony ones. So a quick quiz question here. Which of these two journals is real and is cited by researchers, and which one will publish any old bullshit for money? The International Journal of Advanced Computer Technology or the Journal of Computer and System Sciences? And we'll find out why this is not a good idea. Before I look at science at its best, let's first look at junk science at its worst, because a lot of people are confused about the reliability of scientific journals, and they're right to be sceptical. With the rise of the internet, the number of scientific journals has ballooned, and we've seen a steep rise in the number of fraudulent papers retracted. So how can you tell whether a journal is respectable and doing a proper job of peer review or whether the journal is not worth the paper it's not written on? The first thing to check is if it's listed as a scientific journal on the Master Journals list, which catalogues reputable journals. Libraries will only stock journals that are on the list. If it's on the Master Journals list, the next step is to check the journal's impact factor in journal citation reports. That's the average number of times each of its papers is cited by other studies in a particular year. As a guide, I'd expect a reasonable journal to have an impact factor of at least two, and a good one would have an impact factor of at least five. But it varies according to the scientific discipline. And be careful, because there are even phony citation reports out there and unscrupulous researchers can easily bump up their citation score by churning out nonsense and getting it published. In 2013, a French computer analyst discovered that 120 papers published at science conferences in China had been generated by computers and were scientific gibberish. The papers were later withdrawn. Those two things, whether it's on the Master Journals list and its impact factor in journal citation reports, should tell you most of what you need to know about a journal. It would have allowed you to differentiate between these two journals very quickly. The same goes for the Journal of Natural Pharmaceuticals and the Annual Review of Pharmacology and Toxicology. And if a study is so game-changing it's been brought to your attention, there usually won't be any grey area. An important paper will be in a traditional journal if it's legitimate, or in a poorly cited open access journal if it isn't. That's not to say all open access journals are bad, of course they're not. Many are beginning to get a good reputation. But most still don't have a reputation to uphold, which is why nearly all the fraud, errors, gibberish and retractions are found in these new online journals. Medical journals have been especially prone to a rash of bad papers. As for assessing a paper itself, if it's an older paper, then you can look at the number of citations. Respected and important papers will be cited much more by other researchers. But as before, be careful and check the citations. It's now so easy to publish online that an author can easily cite his own paper several times simply to bump up the figures and sometimes citation isn't an endorsement of the paper, but a criticism. So find out if the paper's been commented on, or corrected, or even retracted. If the paper is very old, has it been superseded by subsequent research? Traditional journals aren't immune to errors, of course. It's just that they get far fewer, and they have other problems like the exorbitant subscription costs and copyright issues that prevent even authors from getting copies of their own papers. Open access may one day become a much better and cheaper way to publish, it's just not there yet, and paying for publication is open to abuse. 
At the moment, traditional journals are still by far the most reliable way to advance science, and it's a system that stood the test of time for the last three and a half centuries, taking us from this to this. And that brings us back to the claim of Pons and Fleischmann that got the 1980s media so excited about a new form of limitless, cheap energy. When reporters hear about a new discovery like this, whether they're science reporters or general reporters, they're usually not experts. They can understand what they're hearing, but they've got no way of evaluating it. By knowing it's been published in a respected, peer-reviewed scientific journal, we can be assured that one or two other experts have fact-checked it and that it has some merit. Had peer reviewers done that with the Pons Fleischmann experiment before the press conference, they might have red flagged some of the flaws that were subsequently found. But believe it or not, this is how a lot of people think science should be done do away with peer review altogether and open the doors to allowing anyone to publish anything. In other words, turn the scientific literature into the blogosphere. If someone wants to publish a paper saying vaccines cause autism, let them. If they want to say the Earth is expanding, what's wrong with that? The highest number of likes gets to be true. Don't you see what's happening here? It's attached itself to me. It's alive! <laughs> By stifling such novel ideas, they say, the scientific establishment is just being closed-minded. We're living in the world of alternative facts, so schools should be able to use whatever is trending on the Internet as teaching material in science class, after all, what's scientific publishing ever done for us?